Okay, welcome to our discussions on Berlin and the Cold War later today and tomorrow. My name is Ingo Trauschweitzer, I'm Professor of History and the Director of the Contemporary History Institute at Ohio University. I'm hosting this program together with U.S. Marine Corps historian Dr. Seth Givens. Before doing anything else, I would like uh, to extend my sincere thanks to the people and institutions who have allowed us to build this program. Even though we couldn't meet in person and on campus, as we had initially hoped to do last fall, 2020, logistics still posed its challenges, and of course, the online format brings its own technological issues. Thanks go to Connie Hunter at CHI for all the logistics and more, to the university's communications and marketing team for PR and for giving us a way to stream and make these discussions accessible to audiences, both local and, I hope, global. To the Ohio University Foundation for all their help in securing the necessary funds, and to the colleagues and students at CHI who carry on our tradition of advancing international history and the study of contemporary history. You might say an intellectual biotope is one thing, money to uh, nourish or feed it quite another. And so simply put, we couldn't have made this happen uh, without a major grant from the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation and with help from several co-sponsors. And here I am grateful to the German Foreign Office and its consulate at Chicago the Society for Military History, and Ohio University's Baker Peace Studies program, as well as those donors to the Contemporary History Endowment that have given us some freedom from the ups and downs, though mostly downs, uh, of state and university budget cycles. I'd like to thank all of them for extending uh, into uh, uh, this fall what was supposed to be spent and accounted for last October. And I'd also like to thank the Allied Museum in Berlin and the Berlin Center for Cold War Studies for their programmatic input. So we're looking at the global Cold War uh, through a, a local lens. Uh, and this made me wonder, how does one go bigger and bolder than international or global? And it occurred to us that perhaps turning to an astrophysicist who studies the universe accomplishes just that. Uh, so it's a great pleasure. That Dr. Joseph Shields, Ohio University's Vice President for Research and Creative Activity and the Dean of our Graduate College, is joining me here this afternoon. He's been a stalwart supporter to Contemporary History Institute, as well as a great champion of scholarship at our university, and I'm delighted that he's going to add his welcome remarks to mine. Joe? Thank you, Ingo, for your kind introduction. And let me wish everyone a, a good afternoon. And on behalf of Ohio University, I'm pleased to welcome you to the symposium on the important topic of Berlin and the Cold War. For those of us who grew up in the 1960s and 1970s, the Cold War was a persistent background in media framing of world events. And it also connected to many of us personally. In my own case, in the Midwestern town where I grew up, could drive a few miles out into the country and encounter a mysterious compound featuring unusual radio antennae encircled by a high fence. And the only indication of what was there was a small sign at the turnoff on the highway with the letter M. It turns out that the letter M was for missile and the mysterious compound was one of the many Titan II ICBM silos in the region. During my years as a young teenager, my colleagues and I enjoyed scaring each other, not only with stories of ghosts and zombies, but also the mushroom clouds that would soon envelop all of us when the Russians let loose their opening salvo of a nuclear exchange. In the media framing of the Cold War, Berlin, of course, loomed large as the front line of the standoff of superpowers. The Berlin Wall provided a visible symbol of the stark division between East and West that existed both locally and globally. And beyond that symbolism, the large international military presence in the city made it an important nexus for diplomatic and cultural exchange over multiple decades. The conference you are participating over these two days addresses a set of deep, rich, and timely questions related to the role of Berlin as both a symbol and a point of engagement in structuring global relationships. The aftermath of the Cold War continues to shape international relations in Europe, and its history is increasingly invoked 
as people in the present day attempt to understand the meaning and implications of international collisions of interests in both Europe and increasingly Asia. Ohio University is committed to supporting forefront scholarship that advances our understanding of these questions. I'm proud of our Contemporary History Institute for the intellectual community and support it provides for advancing historical inquiry and for fostering the type of interaction represented by this conference. On behalf of Ohio University, I want to thank our speakers for your contributions to this event and offer my best wishes to all for a productive and stimulating symposium. And Ingo, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, I hope we can live up to that. So what can we, what can you expect uh, from today's panel discussion that commences at, at 1.30 uh, and to 2 tomorrow at 10 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. all Eastern time, uh, that is. So uh, I, I guess that would mean 7.30 in the evening, uh, 4 in the afternoon and 7.30 in the evening again in Berlin. What's to be learned from studying a global event through the lens of one city? For one, this symposium brings together some of the leading diplomatic, military, and political historians of the Cold War. As a group, uh, they'll consider uh, Berlin's role and place in the Cold War, but also zoom out to broader issues, strategy and defense plans, national and alliance politics, and Cold War culture. But I also hope sort of thinking about the contemporary in Contemporary History Institute, that this symposium will provide perspectives on the Cold War that could help us engage uh, with both historical and contemporary questions. With this program, we're building uh, on the rich history of Baker Peace Conferences over the past three and a half decades, but we also chart a path forward for the study of Cold War frontiers, uh, balancing the rising awareness of the conflict in and over the global south, or in, in the terminology of the time, the third world, with the need to keep a closer eye uh, on one of the Cold War's hottest spots, and the city that became a symbol for the Cold War's end, too, when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Our panels focus on the crisis-filled early years of the Cold War, that's at 1.30 this afternoon, on the Berlin Wall crisis and seemingly greater stability thereafter, uh, that's tomorrow morning, and on the end of the Cold War era and visions for the future, that is tomorrow afternoon. I also hope that some of our discussions will point at significant questions for present day concerns. Are we in a new Cold War? That is a question uh, that Wolfgang Mersinger, the uh, German Consul General at Chicago, will take up in our concluding talk tomorrow afternoon, but it may well be in the back of your mind throughout the proceedings. After all, we hear about it frequently in public discourse when it comes to the relationship of the US and, and Russia or China. Sometimes we hear about it with respect to North Korea, perhaps even Iran, though I think the metaphor does get more strained the farther it is stretched. Giving voice to thoughts of my co-host Seth Givens too, we believe that Berlin and the Cold War offers lessons for our time, though we also need to take account of the differences between crises then, whether they're over Berlin, Korea, Cuba, Indochina, or the Taiwan Strait, and now still including Korea, South China Sea, Ukraine, uh, and other uh, countries and regions. But we need not forget that crises may have been intense, and yet there were also years of greater political stability of diplomatic and cultural engagement. And we generally shouldn't rush to judgment either based on a misapplied historical analogy or too quickly digested lessons. So surely Berlin during the Cold War tested Western resolve and unity. And it leads to some of our guiding questions for this program. Could the city be defended? If not, should such an exposed position be maintained? What opportunities did the Western presence in a militarily vulnerable spot provide? And how do these questions look and change uh, when approached from the Soviet and East German perspectives. And finally, does what we take away from such considerations translate into the 2020s? I hope you'll enjoy these, these panel discussions. Uh, you can follow the live stream on YouTube and Facebook, and you can ask questions in the comments there, uh, which I will monitor and then read to our, to our speakers. Uh, we hope that your questions will help us sharpen what we think should be an engaging and important book. Our goal uh, 
for making the findings of this program more accessible to those who should know. I'd like to add my thanks uh, to all our participants. It's somewhat sad that we can't convene in Athens, uh, which would have been a bit of a homecoming for many of us, but uh, at least this online format should still give us ample opportunity for a constructive conversation and also invite an international audience to weigh in. Following a virtual coffee break, about 20 minutes or so, uh, we'll convince, uh, convene right here for the first panel in at 1.30 Eastern time.
from Athens, Ohio, to the opening panel discussion of our symposium on Berlin and the Cold War. I'm Ingo Trauschweitzer, the director of the Contemporary History Institute at Ohio University. And we're again like to express my thanks to our sponsors, Checkpoint Charlie Foundation, the, the uh, German Foreign Office and its consulate at Chicago, the Society for Military History, and Ohio University's Baker Peace Studies program. Thanks are also due to the Allied Museum Berlin uh, and the Berlin uh, Center for Cold War Studies, who helped us with, uh, with, with program points. Our program on the whole aims to consider key aspects of a global event through the lens of one city, though surely one of the Cold War's hottest spots. This first panel specifically addresses the events of a turbulent decade in Berlin, the years immediately following the end of the Second World War as the Cold War came into focus and crises and the fear of renewed war seeped into everyday life. But we believe that the fate of the city, or, or more broadly, uh, the structures that, that started to take shape, allow for broader conclusions about the changing nature and growing intensity of the Cold War, too. I'll introduce uh, all our speakers now, and uh, then each will talk for, for about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, after that, we have time for questions, uh, which you can pose uh, in the YouTube uh, and Facebook comments sections. I'll monitor them uh, and then put uh, at least some of them uh, to our scholars and experts. Our first speaker will be Dr. Seth Givens. He will address the U.S. Army and the defense of Berlin, 1945 to 1950. Dr. Givens is a historian at the U.S. Marine Corps History Division in Quantico, Virginia, where he is published on Marine operations in the Vietnam War and is currently preparing the official history of U.S. Marines in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Seth earned his PhD in international and military history from Ohio University. And in his spare time, uh, he's published on US policy and strategy during World War II and on NATO during the Cold War. Following him, we have Dr. Petra Goethe, professor of history and chair of the Department of History at Temple University and the editor of the journal Diplomatic History. Her research interests are in U.S. foreign relations, transnational culture and gender history. And Dr. Goethe is the author of uh, GIs and Germans, Culture, Gender and Foreign Relations, 1945 to 49. And most recently of the Politics of Peace, a global Cold War history which appeared uh, just about two years ago. Together with Akira Irie, she is the author uh, of the forthcoming book International History, a Cultural Approach, which should be out in 2022 with Bloomsbury Press. In general, she's published widely on Cold War history, the history of cultural globalization, human rights, and gender in foreign relations history. This afternoon, Dr. Goethe will return to her scholarly roots and talk about making friends, making allies, American GIs in post-war Germany. Third speaker this afternoon is Dr. Christian Ostermann, the long-serving director of the Cold War International History Project and of the History and Public Policy Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. His most recent book, Between Containment and Rollback, The United States and the Cold War in Germany, appeared earlier this year from Stanford University Press. Historian of contemporary U.S. foreign policy in Germany, Ostermann is the author of numerous articles and document editions. To mention just two that are most relevant here today, his 1996 article on the 1953 East German Uprising won the German Studies Association's Best Article Prize, and he's also draw, uh, drawn uh, just fame, I think, for his, his document uh, collection, Uprising in East Germany 1953, the Cold War, the German Question, and the first major upheaval behind the Iron Curtain. Dr. Ostermann, uh, we'll speak this afternoon about Berlin 1953 as a Cold War crisis. And now to Seth Givens. Thank you, Ingo. Uh, as co-organizers of the symposium, I want to echo what Ingo said, his sentiments of thanking all of our, our partners and sponsors and our participants, and as well as uh, all of you who will be here watching, um, particularly that 
everyone seemed to be able to roll with the punches as far as the pandemic goes. And uh, we had to postpone this by a year, but, and then fully go virtual, but um, looking forward to it. So thanks again. Uh, before I begin, I should start as a federal employee. I have to provide the caveat that um, these are my views, my opinions alone, and don't necessarily reflect those of the United States Marine Corps or the United States Marine Corps History Division. Okay, um, much has been made of Berlin's transformation between 1945 and 1949 from the capital of a defeated enemy into a symbol of Western resolve. Historians and political scientists have created excellent scholarship on crisis decision making, the roles of individuals, the mechanics of the airlift, and the experience of Berliners. Scholars have any number of interpretations of events during the period, but perhaps one of the few points that a plurality of scholars agree on is the inherent tension of the Berlin uh, Allied position in Berlin, that it was militarily indefensible, but politically vital. That vitality was due to the city becoming a symbol of Western resolve. And it's that resolve that I wanna focus on. And my interest is in how those responsible for defending a position 110 miles inside Soviet territory viewed Berlin. And I wanna outline what plans they formed and what they advocated for. I want to do this through looking at the U.S. Army defense planning for Berlin between 1945 and 1950, and for time reasons, I'm concentrating just solely on the Americans. Most studies, that sp studies of the era, specifically the Berlin blockade, uh, focus on the upper reaches of American national security establishment, which is to say President Harry Truman and his cabinet, but my objective is to look at the Pentagon down rather than the Pentagon up. So in other words, the operational and tactical level of Berlin planning, not the strategic level. Examining that level, I think, is, reveals where Berlin fit within European defense and how the U.S. military viewed the city before it became a symbol. And, and that symbolism is important, is indeed important, but I contend that it sometimes obscures how we understand Berlin in the Cold War, as it stresses political issues over military ones. And Berlin, as I think that will be reminded throughout this symposium, was indeed both, and it's impossible to separate the two. Now, the U.S. Army's focus in Berlin between 1945 and 1947 was on administering the American sector, while the military governments and the Western sectors sparred with their Soviet counterparts on everything from mail delivery to Berliners' da daily caloric intake. There was not genuine concern for any Red Army attempt to oust the Western powers from the city for the first two years or so. That changed in late spring 1947. Prior to that, most estimates from senior military leaders about Moscow's intentions concluded that the Soviet Union would not pursue a general war to advance its interests until 1950. That assumption began to change in late 1946 with the de deterioration of East-West relations over a variety of issues, chief of which was disagreements over European recovery and Germany's place in it. By spring of 1947, various echelons of the U.S. Army on both sides of the Atlantic began contemplating what a Soviet invasion of Europe would look like. And there were three U.S. Army headquarters or offices that studied the problem. The first one was Lucia, uh, Lieutenant General Lucius D. Clay's Office of Military Government, United States, or OMGUS, headquartered in Berlin. It administered the U.S. occupation of Germany. Second was Major General Clarence B. Hubner's European Command, or UCOM, headquartered in Frankfurt. Hubner reported to Clay and was responsible for the security of all U.S. personnel, organizations, and units involved in the occupation. Third was the U.S. Army's Plans and Operations Division at the Pentagon under the leadership in 1947, at least, of Major General Loris Norstad. Plans and Operations had various branches, all of which had sometimes competing views on Berlin. And it was those branches that studied problems and developed plans for the employment of the U.S. Army forces throughout the world. In June 1947, the same month the United States unveiled the Marshall Plan, all three headquarters and offices began forming war plans. UCOM initially took the lead. It assumed that the Red Army would attack the British and American occupation zone simultaneously. General Clay hoped for such a scenario as he was more worried about the consequences of the Soviets focusing on only one power at a time, and if that occurred, the political and legal time involved and one ally coming to the aid of the other could amount to several days. This would cripple the U.S. and British forces' ability to absorb the Soviet attack and mount a defense in Europe. UCOM planners envisioned any Soviet aggression would begin in Berlin, given its location. And they believed that the only hope for holding the city was if the Red Army focused on one sector at a time, one Western sector at a time. This would allow the Western allies to seek refuge in other sectors of Berlin and then evacuate by either land or air. Joint Chiefs of Staff reviewed these UCOM plans in 1947, and their own planners suggested to Clay 
that he recruit the German staff that planned the Wehrmacht retreat after Operation Overlord. By September 1947, Yukon planners took on even more pessimistic view than their earlier conversations that year, and they now assumed that an Allied victory was unlikely. The Red Army had an estimated 324,000 men at hand to the U.S. forces 165,000. There were 20 Soviet divisions in the Eastern Occupation Zone. The U.S. Army had only the 1st Infantry Division in Germany, and one of its battalions was in Berlin. The rest of the division was spread throughout the American Occupation Zone on occupation duties. This disparity in strength meant that the U.S. and British units could only fight a delay in action at the Rhine River, while all dependents evacuated at Dunkirk, Le Havre, and Bremerhaven. Military and civilian ships were to ferry the remnants of whatever was left of the Western powers combat forces across the English Channel and live to fight another day. Because Yukon believed any long-term defense was hopeless, it concluded that the Berlin and Vienna garrisons should capitulate in the event of a Soviet attack. And it's important to understand that the U.S. Army viewed Berlin and Vienna on equal military terms in these days before Berlin took on symbolic value. The Army saw both as exposed positions that would endanger the main force. And as such, Yukon planned for the outright surrender of the garrisons rather than committing resources to hopeless fights. The surrender would leave 18,588 Allied civilian and military personnel, along with two battalions of the 16th Infantry Regiment, to fend for themselves. And there was the paradox of Berlin for the U.S. Army. The city was the Western power's most vulnerable position in Europe, but it was also the Allies' best hope for detecting the Soviet invasion of Western Europe. Since the assumption was that the Red Army would reckon with Berlin first, military leaders believed there would be some warning in the city before a full-scale Soviet attack. And it was in this context in late 1940 context and this late in late 1947 that Yukon became hypersensitive to Soviet behavior in Berlin. Any technical or administrative difficulties in the city could be more than just harassment, they thought. They could be the opening sequence of an invasion of Western Europe. Berlin planning shifted from Germany to Washington in January 1948. It did so by direction of Secretary of the Army Kenneth C. Royal. He ordered General Norstad's directorate to study the courses of action if the Soviets attempted to push the Western Allies from the city. Unlike UCOM, Pentagon planners viewed the situation in light of the politics of the Cold War. While UCOM saw Berlin strictly as a military position, Army headquarters understood that abandoning the city would have compounding effects. And this is an important distinction I want to make between the level of levels of planning bodies. UCOM concerned itself with the technical problem of defending Berlin. The Pentagon, by contrast, appreciated the politico-military nature of the Cold War. Army headquarters agreed with UCOM that the Soviets were likely to restrict road, rail, and water access to Berlin, but it believed that such obstructionism was not the first step toward a general war. This put the, the Pentagon in agreement with General Clay, whose confidence in the American atomic monopoly led him to argue beginning at the end of 1947 that an armed convoy was the best way to defeat a Soviet blockade of Berlin. While the Pentagon was never willing to go that far, it did agree with Clay that the United States should show resolve in the face of administrative difficulties. And they did so because they foresaw two outcomes of withdrawing from Berlin. The first was the Western Allies would be abandoning two million Berliners to communism, a move that would damage Western prestige. Second, it could lead to the dissolution of the, the Allied Control Council, the four power body responsible for governing Germany. And if that occurred, they thought, the division of Germany into East and West would be all but finalized. The staff study made its way around Washington throughout January 1948. Both Secretary of Defense James Forrestal and Secretary of State George Marshall concurred with Army headquarters' conclusions. The study was not, however, sent to the National Security Council for referral. And this was because Secretary Royal did not think it was necessary for the Army, Navy, and State Department uh, since they agreed in, in principle. Six months before the Berlin blockade, then, there was a consensus in the Pentagon, and leaders believed three things. The first was that the Soviets would attempt administrative difficulties in Berlin. The second was that those difficulties would not signal a, a general war. And the third was that the United States should stand firm in the city. Crucially, though, there was no plan on actually how to do that last point. This omission was laid bare after the Soviets announced on 30 March 1948 new identification and inspection protocols for Allied trains transiting between the Western zones and Berlin. Red Army soldiers stopped several trains entering the city the next day. The restrictions were in retaliation to the Allies' London agreements, which integrated the three Western occupation zones into the Marshall Plan and established a provisional federal government for those states. 
The April crisis was ultimately re and relatively minor. The British and Americans launched a small-scale airlift to, remove, to move personnel and supplies between the zones and the sectors, and that was significant for three reasons. Uh, first, it forced the Allies to find solutions to the questions that the Pentagon identified months before of how the American garrison could withstand Soviet pressure. Second, those discussions formed the basis for emergency planning in June when the Soviets blocked ground access to Berlin. And third, the episode made General Omar Bradley, who became the Army Chief of Staff after the January planning sec that Secretary Royal ordered, and made him contemplate the possibility that the Soviet interference could begin small, but then lead to a choice between leaving an untenable position or remaining and risking war. Bradley and Army leaders did not have answers to the last point, but they concluded that Clay's armed convoy, which he lo again lobbied for repeatedly, was out of the question. The Allies were outnumbered and was foolhardy, foolhardy to consider a strictly military option for a politico-military issue. Second, they also realized that the Western powers had no real options for retaliatory measures. Army headquarters and the State Department both surveyed the situation and concluded that no measures could positively impact the situation. Moreover, if the United States took measures against the Soviets, there was myriad ways Moscow could counter. Berlin, therefore, presented a unique problem. It was unthinkable to defend with military means, but it was also too risky to apply pressure on Moscow elsewhere to guarantee the safety of the Western sectors. The United States did not have answers to any of these questions when the Soviet Union blocked rail traffic on the night of 23 June 1948 in retaliation for the Western powers' inclusion of Berlin's Western sectors into their, their zonal currency reform. Much has been written about the decision-making process during the blockade. It's well established that the State and Defense Department's officials attempted to brief Truman on three courses of action, leading to Truman shutting down any discussion of withdrawing from the city. It's also well established that the airlift was considered a non-provocative short-term solution until a more concrete policy and a diplomatic initiative were devised. But in the absence of the latter, the former became the policy. The primary point I want to make about the blockade is that Army headquarters estimates in June 1948 were qualitatively different than they were in January. Though planners pinned contingencies that aligned with Truman's desire to stay in Berlin, they also advocated for the evacuation of non-essential personnel and ad attacked Clay's repeated attempts to utilize an armed convoy. Some of this was due to the change or changes in planning personnel in the intervening months, but it was mostly because of the stark reality of a conflict over Berlin that was sure to be lopsided with, without use of any atomic weapons, or without the use of atomic weapons. Stalin opened up negotiations to end the blockade in early 1949. On 5 May, the four powers announced an end to the blockade in one week. Most scholarship on Berlin during this period ends in any analysis of military action after the conclusion of the blockade, and this misses a key point, I think. Surviving the blockade did not bring clarity to the Western powers position in Berlin. Five days after Stalin lifted the blockade, the National Security Council met in the White House to discuss the possible courses of action if Moscow resumed Allied access restrictions to Berlin. Decision makers still struggled to answer the question of what their strategy in Berlin was. The NSC concluded in the resulting policy paper called NSC 24-1 that the only options available to them was an airlift and avoiding of probing ground access. They therefore repeated their approach from 1948 and replaced strategy with operations and tactics. A new solution came the following year. For this reason, it's my belief that any examination of the first Berlin crisis period is incomplete if it stops at 19, of May 1949. Discussions for how to defend the city finally moved beyond the 1947-48 considerations in summer 1950. Solutions uh, perhaps paradoxically, uh, came out of the Korean War, not the blockade. The Korean War confirmed to army leaders in Washington, Frankfurt, and Berlin that the Soviets were shifting their expansionist strategy from direct confrontation with the West to operating through proxies. In Berlin, this meant the Soviets could use the recently formed German Democratic Republic to attack the Western position in the city. This led the United States to seek new solutions to the problem of Berlin's defense. The primary architect in the post-blockade period was Major General Maxwell Taylor, who succeeded Brigadier General Frank L. Halley as U.S. commander in Berlin. Like other army leaders, Taylor viewed the GDR as a proxy for the Soviet Union. He identified the newly created paramilitary force, the Volkspolizeibereitschaften, as the primary threat to the Western sectors. A police force in name only, the unit was 90,000 strong in summer 1950 and divided between five groups – 
that each had one tank and one motorized division. Motorized division. It was nominally an anti-riot and anti-insurgency force, but its disposition, organization, and equipment effectively made up the Eastern Army six years before such a force was formally established. Taylor proposed courses of action in an August 10, 1949 study that he sent to both UCOM and Clay's civilian successor, John J. McCoy. This paper served as the basis for Allied discussion about Berlin policy throughout the year. Taylor predicted that GDR officials would claim sovereignty after the October 1950 general election, giving them control of Berlin access. These Germans would then declare the Allies were in the city illegally, demand they evacuate, and then impose a blockade. Taylor recommended expanding the German police to create a paramilitary, paramilitary and home guard force. Allied officials, including the Joint Chiefs of Staff, agreed with Taylor's plan. In a few months' time, the regular police were rearmed. Its ranks, its ranks grew by 3,000, and a volunteer reserve force of 6,000 was added. Taylor's augmentation of Western military power with local forces was a positive step toward integrating Berliners into plans for their own defense. And I think actually there's a good study to be made of that. But that did not offer a structural solution. That, I argue, came at the New York Foreign Ministers meeting in September 1950. The conference was not originally intended to focus on Germany and Berlin, but interdepartmental conversations throughout August and McCoy's prompting had steered the proposed topics of discussion in that direction. At the meeting, the, the three Western powers discussed a paper that Taylor penned about how to maintain the Allied position in Berlin against potential East German military force. Taylor stressed the need for the Allies to state their unequivocal intention, as he said, to maintain their rights in the city at the risk of war. The Western Allies made such a declaration on 19 September 1950. Within a communique on Germany, they declared that they would treat any attack against the Federal Republic or Berlin as an attack upon themselves. In a separate agreement on Berlin security, they restated their warning to Moscow. They also explicitly warned Moscow that the Soviet Union would be held responsible for an East German attack. If there was an attack, the Allies vowed to defend the city by force and then invoke NATO's Article 5 Mutual Defense Clause. So when viewing Berlin from a fledgling NATO, the foreign minister's statement takes on a different complexion. In making the western sectors of Berlin's NATO's frontier outpost, the Allies bought time for the alliance. Critically, as a deterrent, the agreement protected Western Europe as much as it did Berlin. In this way, it fit into NATO's conventional force posture. So in sum, the American solution to the U.S. Army's problem of defending Berlin was to fully integrate the city into a transatlantic politico-military defense arrangement. That did not alter geography, to be sure, but it did lower a shield over Berlin, thereby deterring Soviet, Soviet or East German aggression by raising the specter of general war. This would create other problems at the end of the 1950s, of course, and not, yet, and not avoid yet another crisis eight years later, as we will hear later in the symposium. But crucially, the solution did create more military options for leaders later when Berlin became a flashpoint of the Cold War yet again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gibbons. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Goethe. Hello, sorry there for the little delay. Um, little technical problem. Um, I want to thank Ingo Trauschweitzer and Seth uh, Givens for organizing this, as well as Ohio University and the sponsors for making this possible, even though we all wished we could have been there in person, but this works uh, pretty well. It's a pleasure to kick off this symposium together with uh, Seth and Christian. Um, so just as I was beginning to seriously think about what I could say about the German-American cultural diplomacy and GIs in Berlin, the drama of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan unfolded on our television screens and in the international media. And I couldn't help but remember how in the early 2000s, in the early days of the occupation of Iraq, Condoleezza Rice and Donald Rumsfeld invoked parallels between Iraq and Afghanistan, between Iraq, Afghanistan, and the American occupation of Germany. And at the risk of doing, going down a rabbit hole here, let me briefly recap for our audience the Bush administration's mindset 20 years ago. So both 
Rice and Rumsfeld brought up the success of the American occupation in Germany as a reason to feel confident about the U.S. ability to turn Afghanistan and Iraq into well-functioning and stable democracies. They reminded inquisitive reporters at press conferences that Germany in the early days of the occupation was teeming with saboteurs and vigilante groups, such as the so-called werewolves who wreaked havoc on the invading troops, threatened Germans who were caught collaborating with the invaders, and even assassinated the mayor of Aachen. Never mind that most of those acts occurred on orders of the Nazis before the official surrender of Germany. So while most academic historians immediately dismissed their reference to the werewolves as false, some still defended the validity of the comparison, among them the German historian Jeffrey Herf, who wrote in 2003, and I quote here, if the Federal Republic of Germany, for all its shortcomings, could emerge from the ruins of the Third Reich, I see no compelling historical reason why over time in Iraq with political democracy and market econo economics cannot emerge as well. Today, as after 1945, patience and firmness at the helm of American foreign policy were and remain indispensable. Of course, Herf and those who express confidence in the United States' ability to democratize and stabilize countries in the Middle East and Central Asia were proven wrong. The reasons why Germany was a success in Afghanistan, Iraq, and many other occupations for that matter were failures are, of course, manifold. But it wasn't for lack of money or manpower, as a 2003 Rand Corporation study suggested. That study was meant as a prescription for the Iraqi mission, and it found that, and here I quote as well, um, it is the level of effort the United States and the international community put into their democratic transformations. Nation building, as this study illustrates, their study, is a time and resource consuming effort. To be sure, money and effort might go a long way, but they are not enough. It was rather the non-material, hard to quantify aspects of the American presence in Germany that made a decisive difference. The occupation in Germany was successful for many reasons, among them that American occupiers could rely on a stable internal bureau bureaucratic administrative structure, on indigenous support for reform and democratization, on a homogenous population without much internal political strive on tangible and clearly visible immediate benefits for the entire population in its return to democracy. These pre-existing structures helped American civil affairs officials forge informal relationships with local administrators, build up a level of trust, and this is important, and transition from functioning as executors of an imperial authority to working as mediators between the local population and the imperial command. You might object to me calling the military occupation an imperial command, but that is really what it was in Germany at the time. In Germany, it came down to trust, trust in the commitment of the military government to support Germany's rehabilitation. And that brings me to the main point of this presentation, the role of informal interactions in the relationship between Americans and Germans in the aftermath of World War II. What I'm talking about here is more expansive than cultural diplomacy, namely all forms of interaction between representatives of the American military government and German civilians. Informal relations might be part of cultural diplomacy, but they also operate independent of diplomatic channels through a multitude of individual encounters that occurred between people of different national and cultural backgrounds. So one key to the success of cultural diplomacy is to accept a level of reciprocity, to make it an exchange rather than a re-education process. Cultural diplomacy without that level of reciprocity veers into the direction of propaganda. Reciprocity is established through things like student and academic exchanges, artistic or cultural collaborations, or global events such as international sports competitions, like the Olympic Games or uh, the World Cup in soccer. In post-war Germany, there existed both, a one-sided re-education effort directed by the Civil Affairs Division and a, multiple, a multitude of diverse personal exchanges. 
Those included individual and informal relations, as well as more formal events such as youth activities. I would also consider food and humanitarian aid as part of cultural diplomacy, even though it looks like a one-sided affair. Many Americans, for instance, sent care packages to Germans after World War II, and the reception of these food packages were one significant way in which Germans interacted directly with American families. So the argument I want to make today is this. The occupation and the democratic rehabilitation of Germany after World War II would not have been possible without this high level of cultural and personal engagement between occupiers and occupied. In other words, and I have made this argument before, these personal exchanges mattered. They provided the glue that held the occupation together and produced the resu desired results. But and that is the other point I want to make here, uh, and that is one of unpredictability. Informal relations, because they rest on reciprocity and rely on informal, non-governmental agents of exchange, could not be controlled easily by a military or official diplomatic apparatus. And that meant that cultural interactions almost always had unintended consequences. In some cases, consequences that undermined the original objective of high-level diplomacy. So in what remains of my time, I want to outline three ways, really three brief sketches, because I don't have the time to elaborate, in which informal relations created such unintended consequences, sometimes shoring up formal diplomatic objectives and others undermining them. Despite this mixed record and, record and unpredictability, these relationships on the whole did more to foster than damage Germany's post-war relationship with the United States. And that is part of why I think, or why we think, of the American occupation of Germany as a success. So example number one, fraternization. As I've argued in my book, fraternization pretty quickly became synonymous with intimate relations between American GIs and German women. That at least became the public perception. Though when we take all informal relationships into account, the picture becomes much more diverse. These relationships did much to cement the close relations and ultimately positive direction of the occupation, but they also created huge headaches for occupation officials. For one thing, they created a disciplinary problem at the outset of the occupation because these relationships were initially prohibited. They also seriously undermined the punitive messages American officials wanted to send to the Germans. But there was another uglier side to these relationships, and that was one of sexual violence. This was a much bigger problem in the Soviet zone, as we know from Norman Neymark's work. He argued convincingly that the mass rapes of Russian soldiers in the waning days of the war in the spring of 1945 seriously undermined any trust Germans, even those leaning left, had towards the Soviets. But rapes and assaults did occur in the Western zones as well. And whenever they occurred, they eroded trust and created fear and resentment. The incidence of rape in the American zone declined after the spring of 1945 and were soon replaced by open courtships in the streets and pubs of West Berlin and Western Germany. Military government officials were at first reluctant to tolerate these relationships, but gradually relented, permitting even marriages by the end of 1946. They still routinely denied petitions by African-American GIs who wanted to wed their German girlfriends, though. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that later. This does not mean that these romantic relationships caused the improvement of relations between the two countries. But the fact that they occurred on such an extensive scale tells us a lot about the close personal interactions that existed between Americans and Germans. They are a symptom rather than they are a symptom rather than a cause of the improvement of relations. At the same time, they demonstrated that to political leaders and occupation officials the limits of their control over the direction of German-American relations. So the second example I want to mention is corruption. 
It is well known that corruption ran rampant in Afghanistan and Iraq, and many outside observers are already blaming corruption for the failure of the American mission in these two countries. In contrast, corruption is rarely mentioned as an issue in the American occupation of Germany. It might lead us to assume that corruption did not occur in post-war Germany, but that would be wrong. Rather, corruption did not irreparably damage the American occupation, though it did undermine its goals to some extent. The most obvious sign of the presence of corruption was, of course, the black market, um, the mar black market that governed much of Germany's urban material transactions in the immediate post-war period, particularly in Berlin. Uh, and Paul Stege has written a wonderful book about the black market in Berlin, arguing that Berliners found ways to evade the controls of the Allied powers, both East and West, in making ends meet in the ruins of the city. And of course, American GIs furnished many of the goods bartered on the black market, above all cigarettes. So the American GIs sustained the black market, which simultaneously undermined the mission of the occupation, but also and this is the positive uh, result for Germans, it also offered Germans a real material lifeline. It also uh, further helped cement an image of the United States as a prosperous nation, which had much more to offer to the German people than the communist East. This was particularly important for those uh, citizens of Berlin who had the direct comparison between East and West. The third example is politics. Um, particularly the politics of the German-American interactions. And here, the story gets more complicated. We all know that the generally accepted goal of the American occupation was to democratize, demilitarize, denazify the German people. American soldiers were soon regarded as the best ambassadors for the free and open American system of liberal capitalist democracy. And it worked in most cases, except not always. First, there was the problem of racial equality. African-American soldiers enjoyed a level of freedom in Germany they did not have in the American South. Yet within the armed forces, they still encountered discrimination and segregation. And this spilled out into the public, uh, into the public sphere. Um, African-American soldiers who dated white women faced continuous harassment within the social spaces of the American military establishment. For instance, if they brought their German girlfriends to a dance, they would be harassed by white soldiers, in some cases with violent, even deadly results. Americans, it turned out, were not the best at teaching Germans about racial tolerance and equality. Cold War politics also interfered with the mandate of demilitarization and denazification. Within five years of the end of World War II, there was talk of rearming the Germans, and denazification was only half done when it was discontinued, with many teachers, jurists, and even politicians and journalists back in positions of power by the early 1950s. Democratization came to mean primarily anti-communism by the early 1950s. American soldiers did not always conform to the official anti-communist political line of their government. Um, in fact, in the early 1950s, over 200 American and other NATO soldiers defected to East Germany. These soldiers appended the narrative of the freedom-loving West versus the repressive East. Their reasons for defection varied widely. Some feared being sent to Korea and later Vietnam. Many tried to escape court martials, either for criminal or political offenses. Among the latter was Stephen Wexler, who in 1952 defected to the GDR from his post near the zonal border in West Germany. Wexler had been a committed communist since his youth. He had attended Harvard University, did a stint as a worker in a steel mill in Buffalo, New York after graduation, attended the first World Youth Festival in Prague in the summer of 1947, and then, to his great misfortune, he was drafted into the army in 1950. He lied about his communist affiliations for fear of being imprisoned. This was the time right after the passing of the McCarran Act. And uh, he was sent um, 
fortunately for him, not to Korea, but to Germany. When the army found out about his past communist memberships, he faced a court martial. And that's when he bolted. At the age of 24, uh, he actually later admitted that he just didn't know any better or didn't know where to turn. Unlike some of his fellow deserters, he quickly accommodated to the socialist system, met a girl, married her, studied journalism at the Karl Marx University in Leipzig, and then moved with his young family to East Berlin. There he worked first as a journalist and later as a freelancer on a variety of different writing projects. He changed his name to Victor Grossman and became an ardent defender of the East German state, even beyond the collapse of the regime in 1989. He actually still lives in Berlin today, um, ironically, maybe somewhat fittingly, on the Karl Marx Allee in Mitten. So East German officials who received these um, defectors were not entirely convinced of their trustworthiness. They initially placed them in the city of Bautzen near the Polish border, where they could surveil them more easily, train them both ideologically and in a variety of trades, and control their leisure activities and their movements. Grossman also spent time in Bautzen. He worked in a factory for a while and soon became the cultural director for the deserters clubhouse. He organized chess and ping pong tournaments, dances and various field trips for the ex-soldiers. Many of these deserters eventually returned to the West. Some because they became disillusioned with socialism as it was practiced in the East, others because they resented their jobs and still others because they simply became homesick. Many of those who had fled because of criminal activities did not simply alter their behavior once in the East, and so that meant that some of them got into renewed trouble with the East German law. And of course, there was the small contingent of spies who fled just as they were being discovered. Some uh, of these spies had been recruited by Western intelligence after they had moved East. Others had posed as deserters in the first place, confirming East German suspicions about them. But a significant number of deserters, including Grossman, stayed, again for various reasons, including political and uh, personal. So the story of these defectors forms part of the larger story about the porousness of the boundaries between East and West Germany about the fluid political divisions between capitalism and communism, and in the broader sense, the unintended consequences of people-to-people -people relations. Scholars have written a lot more about East Germans and Eastern Europeans defecting to the West than in the other direction, with some prominent exceptions. For instance, Bertolt Brecht, who uh, went, moved from his American exile into East Germany. These stories also reveal that American soldiers did not always experience the United States as a country of freedom and equality. A lot of them had serious and legitimate misgivings, and those misgivings only worsened in the 1960s when the United States became deeply embroiled in Vietnam. Thus, while American GIs are often hailed as the country's best ambassadors, they were social and political beings first and representatives of the American nation second. And in the 1950s, if their politics did not align with that of the American government, they were in trouble. At the time, Berlin formed the heart of where these informal interactions occurred and where the public outward facing image clashed with the realities on the ground. Until 1961, at least, American, Russian, French, and British soldiers could freely traverse the border between West and East, and so could Germans. Thus, defection was as easy as walking into a police station in the eastern sector of the city. But these defections raise a bigger question as well. And that is why so many Western soldiers saw no other solution to their troubles than defection to the socialist East. So let me conclude by briefly returning to Afghanistan. The 2003 Rand Corporation report stated that, I quote, the international civilian presence in Afghanistan was deliberately modest, end of quote. In part because of this, 
We know as yet very little about how the local population in Afghanistan reacted to aid to civilian restructuring to the presence of foreign soldiers. Where did the aid go? What was actually built or restructured? What did day-to-day -day interactions between the foreign forces and the native population look like? Future historians will undoubtedly answer some of those questions, but it seems already clear that the level of direct interaction in Afghanistan remained limited. We often underestimate the importance of personal interactions in international relations, and occupation regimes are often uncomfortable with the unpredictability of such personal interactions. And that might well have been a reason for limiting them in Afghanistan and Iraq. Personal connections among individuals outside official channels could serve the national interest or could undermine it. American soldiers in Germany were, were often good ambassadors for their own country, but not always. They put a human and in many cases humane face on the occupation, but they also engaged in violence, corruption, and at times undermined the political message of the occupiers. American officials exercised limited control over these interactions, maybe because they did not exercise sufficient firmness, I'm borrowing here from HERF, in controlling their own soldiers' behavior, or maybe because they decided that, e that these interactions were not irreparably undermining the overall mission of the Americans in Germany. The true lesson of the German occupation experience and the comparison to Afghanistan and Iraq might be that engaging in informal cultural diplomacy or just informal transnational relations is a true mark of a strong democracy, one that tolerates dissent at home and abroad and unpredictability and, and, and abroad and as well as unpredictability and unintended consequences, even if those consequences challenge the official national diplomatic agenda. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Goethe. We turn uh, to our third speaker, uh, Dr. Christian Ostermann, on the uh, 1953 uprising and Cold War as a Cold War crisis, with, I guess, a question mark. Thank you uh, to the organizers, especially to Ingo and Seth. Uh, I'm honored to and delighted to be on a panel with such uh, distinguished colleagues. Um, it would have been indeed fun to be together um, uh, in person um, in, in Athens, but pending pandemic conditions, I commend you for fostering this intellectual comradeship and exchange. I spent some wonderful time at the Contemporary History Institute in the early 1990s, and so it's wonderful, wonderful to be back at least virtually. Shortly after the June 1953 uprising in the Soviet sector of Berlin and East Germany, President Dwight D. Eisenhower professed to be, quote, quite certain that future historians in their analysis of the causes which will have brought about the disintegration of the communist empire will single out those brave East Germans who dared to rise against the canons of tyranny with nothing but their bare hands and their stout hearts as a root cause, unquote. Prophetic as Eisenhower might have, may have been, the 1953 uprising does not usually figure in the traditional Cold War canon of Berlin crises, featuring the 1948 blockade, we have heard about this already, the Khrushchev's 1958 ultimatum, and the 1961 building of the wall in confrontation at Checkpoint Charlie. We'll hear about those later. All of the crises have seared themselves into a larger Western Cold War mass narrative as clear-cut Cold War crises ostensibly prompted by Soviet actions to impede Western access to the city and, th and threaten the Western position and the city's survival uh, and security in Berlin and overcome in large part by Western resolve and strength and by newfound fraternity between Western, between Western allied occupiers and occupied Germans. By contrast, in reflecting Eisenhower's perspective, 1953, is usually seen as the first in a number of upheavals and crises of legitimacy within the Soviet bloc, usually sequenced by 1956, 1968, 1980, 81, and 1989. To be sure, 1953 was a regime crisis, and the uprising was not limited to Berlin. 
The uprising was triggered by the abrupt end uh, of the repressive and draconian policy of the forced construction of socialism. A crash program to socialize GDR agriculture and industry launched by the ruling Socialist Unity Party, the SED, in 1952 at Soviet leader Joseph Stalin's behest. Paradoxically, the only group excluded from the new course liberalization measures announced by the SED in early June 1953, once again at Soviet insistence, were the workers for who, <clears throat> um, for who increased work norms remained in place. Sporadic strikes by angered workers and individual building plans in the preceding days escalated into a call for a general strike and massive demonstrations on June 17. Economic grievances quickly radicalized into calls for political reform in German unity and spread from Berlin throughout the GDR. More than 1 million people in over 700 East German cities and communities are now estimated to have participated in protests between June 16 and June 21. Memories of the uprising would haunt East Germany's communist leaders to the end of their republic. I argue that the 1953 uprising in East Berlin has to be understood as a Cold War crisis as well, and was certainly seen as such by contemporaries. Officials in the West certainly fretted over, over the security implications for Berlin, but the situation was messier, not as clear-cut as other Berlin crises for their, Soviet, for their Soviet and East German counterparts entertained similar concerns. We can only appreciate this, the crisis nature in the context of the tensions in and around Berlin in the early 1950s, which I've tried to analyze in greater detail in a recent book. Berlin in these years was a key note for negotiating and contesting the cold peace between East and West. Take, for example, the Battle of Berlin, as the media dubbed the anxiously expected invasion of West Berlin by squadrons of blue-shirted participants of the massive Free German Youth Rally at the end of May 1950 and the heightened tensions in the aftermath of the North Korean invasion a few weeks later, which may incidentally, which incidentally occasioned a security guarantee for Berlin by the three Western allies in September. Seth referred to this. They repeated that promise in the lead up uh, to the signing of the Bonn and Paris treaties in 1952, when once again Soviet threats to Berlin's security had officials at the highest levels on edge. Later that year, a dramatic swell in East, German, um, in East Germans fleeing the ever more repressive system in the GDR to West Berlin was initially perceived as a concerted effort to destabilize the Western position there. But it was not just Western officials who saw Berlin as the gateway for hostile inroads. To Soviet and SED leaders, West Berlin was a growing threat to the stability and not of the GDR and not without reason. As I've detailed in my book, as a Western outpost inside the GDR, Berlin was not just a show window to the East, but a beachhead for American and allied intelligence and psychological warfare operations behind the Iron Curtain. American military and intelligence agencies, as well as German anti-communist rollback groups sponsored or supported by the United States and the West German government, waged a cold civil war against the GDR from Berlin, a term aptly coined by Stefan Kreuzberger. Much of this involved infiltrating Western propaganda and literature into the East, though in its more radical form, it also included sabotage, tar targeted defections, and econo economic disruptions. Some within the Truman administration envisioned upping Western psychological warfare by creating and directing a resistance move movement inside East Germany that readied for day X and employed a broad arsenal of overt and covert measures complete with sabotage efforts and assassination attempts. The Cold Warriors within the Eisenhower administration around C.D. Jackson, President Eisenhower's special assistant for Cold War affairs, seized on some of these plans in early 1953 in an effort to push for liberation of the captive people uh, that had been a core of the winning Republican election campaign plank. Once the uprising occurred, it surprised everyone. Stunned by the quickly spreading protests in Berlin on June 16, 1953, that took the popular unrest right to the doorsteps of the House of Government in the Wilhelmstrasse, the GDR's government seat, the <clears throat> East Germany's communist leaders had hastily retracted, uh, the, had hastily retracted the industrial norm 
um, increases. But the action failed to stem the tide of anti-government demonstrations, strike and unrest engulfing the Soviet sector in East Germany. At a nightly uh, party cadre meeting, SED strongman Walter Ulbricht, East Germany's little Stalin, admitted mistakes but blamed Western provocateurs for the unrest and called for a propaganda offensive. The next morning, Soviet High Commissioner Vladimir Semyonov evacuated the beleaguered SED Politburo to the Soviet headquarters in Berlin Karlshorst, from where they followed the drama unfolding. For all intents and purposes, the SED leaders had lost control that day. The Soviets, too, were completely surprised by the widespread protests. Neither Soviet military commanders in the GDR nor, Soviet, nor the Soviet High Commission had taken the events starting on June 16 seriously. Charge Marshal Vasily Sokolovsky, the military's foremost Germany hand, who had headed the Soviet military administration after the war, had risen to the position of Deputy Defense Minister and Chief of Staff, and who had been dispatched from Moscow to Berlin at the height of the crisis. At noon, Soviet authorities terminated all tram and metro traffic into the eastern sector and essentially closed the sector borders to West Berlin to prevent further demonstrators from reaching the city center. One hour later, they declared martial law in East Berlin and later in 167 out of 217 districts of the GDR, decreeing curfew between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. Only the forceful active intervention of Soviet tanks and troops on the afternoon of June 17, hastily deployed from Berlin and major cities throughout the GDR, began to quell uh, the popular outburst and prevented the total collapse of the SED government. At least 14 people died in the skirmishes in Berlin, executions and mass arrests followed. From the beginning of the unrest, Soviet officials viewed uh, it as much as a, uh, as a Cold War crisis uh, um, than, as an eternal, than as an eternal matter. Reports reaching Moscow uh, that the British had declared uh, martial law in, the, in their city sector, that NATO forces had been put on alert, that big crowds moved from west into East Berlin probably reinforced such perceptions. While KGB agents with some trepidation and hesitation fanned out to mingle clandestinely among the protesters to understand their demands, top Soviet officials in Berlin assumed from the very first moment that the demonstrations were a major planned provocation by the West. Citing the simultaneous outbreak of unrest across the GDR, the similar de similarity of rebel demands and the prevalence of anti-Soviet slogans uh, were seen as proof uh, the commander of the Soviet forces uh, in Germany, Andrei Gretschko, informed the Politburo in Moscow uh, late on June 17 that the provocation was prepared in advance, organized and directed uh, from, west, from the Western sectors of Berlin. The simultaneous timing and identical nature of tactics and slogans convinced Zokolovsky as well that this could not be anything but a major planned uprising. In the first post-mortem on the crisis a week later, Sokolovsky and Samyonov claimed that June 17 had been the so-called Day X, the day of open action against the GDR by fascist and other underground organizations working primarily under American leadership, under, American, under the leadership of American intelligence. The Soviet officials firmly believed that the unrest had been stirred up by the West, although they fundamentally misread the gen genesis of the home ground protests, their almost reflexive recourse to blaming American-led underground organization demonstrated to the extent to which U.S. psychological warfare efforts had in fact succeeded in fostering the idea of a day X in the Soviets and East, German, East Germans' minds. The crisis cut short whatever discussions of a new course in Germany had gone on in Moscow in the spring of 1953. Even as they reckoned that Ulbricht's Stalinist policies had contributed to the turmoil in the GDR, in the aftermath of the uprising, the Soviet leaders rallied around the embattled leader, extended economic aid, and committed ever more firmly to the SED client state. In light of the Soviet accusations that the uprising had been American inspired, even the Americans, it's ironic that even the Americans were not entirely sure as to any Western role in the origins of the crisis. As late as July 1st, the U.S. High Commission's top GDR watcher confessed that the degree and nature of Western encouragement was not completely known. In fact, American intelligence had not instigated the uprising, 
US, though internally American officials acknowledged that the US sponsored fighting group against inhumanity, better known by its German acronym KGU, one of the most radical German World Bank groups, took an effective and took an active hand in affairs in East Berlin on June 17. The Eisenhower administration was caught as much off guard by the crisis as the Adenauer government, and the cry of these Germans for freedom and German unity threatened to upset the American short and long games in Europe, the re-election of pro-Western Chancellor uh, Konrad Adenauer in that fall's election, and West Germany's integration into Western political and defense structures, keyword European defense community. Just days before the uprising burst onto the world stage, one more report from US officials in Berlin had doubted uh, the East Germans' capacity to mount any kind of opposition movement. And during the initial stages of the unrest, poor intelligence further hampered the misreading of the situation. Early reports of the unrest by Barrias, the popular American radio in the US sector, were met with disbelief. Certainly, US and allied officials in Berlin wondered at first whether they had a major Cold War crisis on their hands, whether the Soviets had deliberately staged the demonstrations in order to create a convenient pretext to remove Ulbricht, or of far greater concern, to move some 20,000 man military forces into East Berlin in preparation for the capture of the entire city. Concerned about an escalation of the crisis in the wake of the Soviet military intervention in the eastern half of the city, US, the U.S. Uh, commandant in Berlin reportedly pulled U.S. forces back from the sector border. By 5 p.m. on June 17, all U.S. troops had been confined to their quarters. Much like the Adenauer government, the US, U.S. officials opted for calm and caution. But it did not instigate the uprising. The United States was not an, was not an innocent bystander either. In addition to longstanding psychological warfare operations, including the support of anti-communist groups who are, whose activities eluded full U.S. oversight and control. Rias helped to spread the news of the early strikes and demonstrations within hours from Berlin across the GDR, and it provided a platform for calls to action by West Berlin politicians and activists that went well beyond factual reporting. Once the outlines of the unrest became clear, the cold warriors within the Eisenhower administration around presidential advisor C.D. Jackson jumped at the chance to roll the Soviets out for keeps, considered supplying arms to the East German rioters, but cautioned by Eisenhower himself that the events did not merit entering into a direct conflict with the USSR, settled on an enhanced psi war program that centered on a food aid program for the East Berliners. The Eisenhower packages program threw the GDR's economic shortages into sharp relief, stoked dissatisfaction within the regime in the weeks after the uprising, and allowed East Berliners and East Germans to act in defiance of the SED regime, which tried everything to prevent the aid program from succeeding. The food, food program, which disseminated more than 5 million food packages into the hands of East Germans and East Berliners, was deemed a great success by the Americans, served as a model for similar efforts in ensuing years, and despite some misgivings by some, boosted further psychological warfare efforts against Soviet satellite regimes. Without endangering West Berlin security or risking a global conflagration, the East, jolted by the uprising, had been dealt another great blow. And yet, the 1953 uprising left a bitter aftertaste that might have made it un uh, unpalpable for any heroic master narrative, not just with the East Berliners and the East Germans, who had to capitulate to Soviet tanks and who tragically saw their very real expectations and hopes for liberation by the West shattered only to, to face ever greater repression and Ulbricht's reemergence re as undisputed leader with Moscow's full backing. For West Germans, who that fall returned Adenauer's party with an absolute majority in parliament, June 17 was no cause for celebration either. As for all their speeches, West Germany's political class had remained largely powerless, passive, and aloof during the, during the events. Even in Washington, enthusiasm over the Psy War victory mixed, at least in some corners of the administration, with a sense, of de with a, with a sense that effecting liberation and rollback 
without the risk of global conflagration, West, uh, uh, risking West Berlin security and inter-allied rifts, or even widespread bloodshed might be an impossible circle to square. Not until the suppression of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution uh, did these contradictions fully sink in. Far messier a crisis than 1948 or 1958-61, at least in the eyes of those who lived it, 1953 posed a complicated, tragic addition or challenge to the heroic master, master narrative of the Cold War crisis in and over Berlin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. We have about 25 minutes or so uh, for questions and answers, and I think actually it might be nice if uh, all our three speakers and myself uh, were to turn the cameras back on uh, so that we're kind of all in the room, uh, all, all at once uh, for this. So I will moderate, uh, and, and of course I would also invite uh, the uh, speakers to ask questions of uh, their, their peers on the panel. Um, I have a definitional question uh, for, for Professor Goethe on, on particularly what you mean by an imperial presence, uh, especially in light of, well, Soviet usage of the term at the time is very much a charge levied at, uh, at the Americans and at the West. Yes, absolutely. So I'm thinking in much broader terms, in terms also uh, of comparative occupations, uh, because in some ways uh, what the United States did in Germany was uh, very much an occupation like earlier ones in Haiti uh, uh, and later ones uh, in, you know, that, that were featured in the, um, in the Rand study. Um, and therefore, uh, it's not so much, I want to actually take the, the negative communist connotation out of it and think about it more in terms of sort of global, global history, that it is the beginning of, um, or the triumph of the American empire, uh, the post, you know, the, the end of World War II. Uh, and in that sense, it was an imperial uh, presence. It was also a complete subjugation of the, of the, Germans, um, and they recognized it uh, as, as such. Nonetheless, the relationship turned quite quickly, uh, and this is the bigger point I want to make, that even though it was an imperial and, a, you know, really an undemocratic um, uh, presence uh, of enforcing a different regime on to Germany, it was something that Germans uh, supported uh, and something that Germans themselves felt was to their benefit. I wonder, I, I was thinking in, in the kind of comparison with, with Japan at the time too, right? And this argument about embracing defeat that, uh, that John Dower made, whether, whether that's to some extent uh, present in the German case too, but that, that led me down the, the path uh, to push a little bit on the question when, right? Did Germans in, you know, summer 1945 ex sort of accept that or is that something that, that, that kind of built? I think it, it built gradually. There was first the, the sense of utter defeat and, uh, and of having to accept this and also a moment of trepidation of what the allies, what the Americans uh, and what the allies, uh, how the allies would uh, govern post-war Germany. And remember, initially, there was this punitive term. There were, you know, Germans, German political officials were aware of the Morgenthau plan. Uh, they were aware and witnessed the dismantling of industrial plants, reparations, uh, and therefore there was a moment of holding their breaths as to how the Americans would rule. And there was this non-fraternization rule. Every German was considered guilty, and therefore they very much felt like under occupation. But this shifted, um, and shifted in a way from the bottom up, and, and I... Uh, Christian, I just read your book, and it's it's a fascinating book. But one thing that that struck me also is is the figure of of Clay. You talk quite a bit about about Lucius D. Clay, and he was one person who initially he basically immediately said, "We can't do this. We can't be uh, punitive with the Germans. We cannot teach democracy on an empty stomach. We need to do these things." And so these experiences. Um, 
on the ground really shifted shifted the dynamic of the occupation, but also shifted German attitudes pretty quickly uh, and made them have a level of, of trust. And I think I'm only developing this idea of trust, what this means, uh, but I think it does play an important role in, in the occupation and in all occupations for that matter. If you trust your occupier that they have your interests in mind, then you are much more cooperative also in the in the process than if you feel like it's an imposition from the outside. No, oh, you're you're on mute, uh, Christian. All right, I, I wonder, Petra, if you could talk a little bit more about um, uh, one aspect in your paper that really fascinated me among several, which is um, uh, which is the two hundred about two hundred defectors to the east. Um, um, I, you know, read some of their cases, but I wonder if you could could talk a little bit about uh, this group that is rarely talked about. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm very curious about how uh, they adapted to to life in East Germany and what kind of sources you're using for 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 that research. So this is something, this is an ongoing project. So right now I've sort of surveyed the secondary literature. There's a German journalist who wrote about them and that figure comes from him. So he has actually looked into, this is um, um, Peter Kopf. Um, oh, it's, it's not showing up. Um, where is Lieutenant Atkins? Uh, mm -hmm. So he has some of these cases, which I found really fascinating. I have come across Victor Grossman uh, many years ago when he published his first book in the early 2000s um, called Crossing the River. And I was at the time, I read it and I, I, I have to say I hated the book <laughs> um, because he, you know, for me, he was just making way too many excuses for, for the East German state. But I've sort of come around and, and taken his, his um, story more seriously. And I think it's a story that we need to explore more closely. So my goal is actually to look at some of, you know, taking taking Cup's initial research, uh, going back and looking at some of these Stasi, Stasi documents, but also look in the, in the US National Archives, and I haven't been able to do this yet. Uh, what are the Americans writing about these, about these, these people? It was clearly a public relations problem for the Americans. Um, and uh, it's part of what I'm sort of trying, and, and so this is why I'm sort of only outlining this. It's part of the bigger story I want to tell about the unintended consequences that in, in, in the early post-war period, especially in the, in, in the late 40s and early 50s, Americans, the American political system became so repressive to so many leftists that it became sort of a relative decision. It's like we cannot actually live in the in the Western system. And this was the impetus for Grossman. And he, he actually published a newer book just a couple of years ago, where he basically says, it's like, well, this was the only option I had available back then. And had there not been this McCarran Act, had there not been the danger, this threat of a, of a court martial and prison, he might not have defected to the East. He might not have embraced his life in the in the East as much as he did. But because he saw repression, he experienced repression um, as a political sort of dissident, for him, it became a relatively, you know, better place in, in East Germany. He was a special case. There were others, and Cubs writes about them, that were just basically criminals and drunks, you know, petty drunks. Who basically said is like I, I don't want to go to prison. I'm going to move east, and then they, some of them, moved back, and they were spies. And 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 you make that point for Berlin that there was, you know, this rollback and and doing it through deserters, potential or or supposed deserters, was one way for the West to infiltrate uh, the East. And some of them clearly were were uh, came over with that intention. Others others were recruited. Um, after they had left as a way, and for them it was a way to basically eventually return to the West. A great project. I look forward to it. It's, it's just a fascinating kind of story at this point. So, <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, the next question in the chat takes us from 200 to 2 million, I guess. Uh, and, and it's uh, really mostly directed at Seth, I think. It's the question, to what extent the two million plus people in Berlin were figured into defense plans. 
Uh, I think on the on the Western side, um, you you make the point later on. Maxwell Taylor makes the argument that uh, you you ought to ought to arm uh, friendly friendly forces, but that does come fairly late. And so, were there any considerations at an at an earlier point, and and or how that population could be protected? No, not that I found in the documents whatsoever. It, as you said, Taylor was the first mention of of any kind of local police force, and so all the documents it, it comes down to U.S. Army planning is not even about evacuating, as we saw with Afghanistan, evacuating any Berliners who assisted in the occupation. That was not discussed. If there was any evacuation discussed, it was civilian American civilians first, and then to evacuate the military units or those that would remain. But no, Berliners are absent. Which is ironic, I know. The Germans are absolutely absent. Well, in fairness, they, they had just given uh, the Allies, both East and West, uh, a significant amount of, of, of problems and were, were not the great friends of the world, I, I suppose, in 1946 or 47, right? But um, thank you for, for, for this. Um, I think I want to turn to, uh, to you, Christian, with a question on sort of the ramifications of, of, of media, particularly RIAS and, and, and like media, uh, in 1953 and after, um, did, I guess as I read the question, is, is, is in essence, did Western governments, especially the U.S. government, um, learn to use these, these outlets maybe more more cautiously or for that matter, more, more, more aggressively in, in, in later crises in the 50s, uh, whether in Poland or, or particularly in Hungary, as, as, as kind of a medium to broadcast a, a Western message that very much still, a US message that very much still included rollback as, as, as at least a rhetorical goal. Yeah, I mean, I've looked, I've not looked um, at the um, uh, archival documentation or the, the history of um, Western media towards the Soviet bloc for the later years. Um, I do think that 1950s, the Hungarian revolution of 1956 was sort of a turning point um, after which I think um, uh, there was, um, um, uh, you know, a lot more, um, there was some introspection and some, some reassessment and um, uh, I think a more sophisticated um, um, policy that developed. Um, um, so I, I, it's hard for me to talk about the later period. Um, um, uh, what's clear is that for the um, uh, that for the early years, um, uh, Rias played an enormous role uh, in East Germany and uh, and Berlin as a whole. As 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 you know, by 1948, overtook um, the. Um, uh, Berliner Rundfunk, the East, the station uh, of the East, um, as the most popular uh, station in Berlin, uh, with uh, an, a reach uh, deep into East Germany, um, and provided in some way sort of an alternative public um, to East Germans, um, uh, was um, uh, very much engaged in covering. Um, uh, key issues, inclu including labor discontent um, in East Germany, um, but when it came um, when it came to the crisis in 1953, the um, the uh, line of factual reporting that was the overarching policy, um, you know, uh, um, uh, was difficult to implement in, in in the crisis moments, especially as Rias became kind of a, a, a node for. Um, the protesters in East Germany to communicate in in, in East Berlin to communicate um, uh, amongst themselves and with the larger populace. So, um, as I as I mentioned in the paper, um, I see the main role, and others have written about this um, as well. I see the main role of Rias as giving visibility, national visibility, to um, the uh, early Berlin protest demands. And um, and uh, helping with the speed um, that the un uh, unrest um, took in spreading across East Germany, um, uh, reaching some you know a million, uh, uh, causing a million people to to um, 
um, uh, to join these protests in one form or another. Thank you. Uh, it's actually a direct follow-up question from a little bit further down in the in the comments section. The West German press, do you was there a kind of a uniform, unified way in which uh, the the fifty three crisis was reported, or did it did it pull in different directions? Um, I, I I think uh, um, uh, it was there was a you know very somber assessment by the West German press. Um, I've not looked at the at West German media uh, specifically. Um, you know, there's there's a lot's been wor um, a lot of work has been done on Adenauer's role, who um, uh, gave um, uh, a speech in Parliament on the afternoon of uh, June 17, but not until a week later um, uh, uh, went to Berlin. Um, 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 so um, there, uh, Adenauer's for Adenauer, the, uh, the uprising really reinforced his own uh, logic of a policy of strength that West Germany, that he had led in West Germany, that would ultimately uh, achieve unification on Western terms. Um, um, uh, but, um, and it reinforced and certainly. Um, uh, helped his election victory in early September 1953 when he won a, um, uh, um, a huge uh, success in the elections. Um, so um, I've not I've not looked closely at the uh, at, at West German media. Um, there was an you know a sense of uh, being powerless in face of the Soviet the, the military suppression of the uprising uh, on the part of many West Germans. It um, became it was um, you know uh, uh, a national day of um, uh, commemoration was established. June 17 became a holiday in uh, West Germany. Um, um, so it's it um, it it um, had a a um, somber echo in um, in the years to come. Um, uh, you know, a very, very different perspective than uh, some of the co-warriors within the Eisen administration in Washington. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Petra, I have a number of questions from, from Ben Green, uh, who helpfully pulled them all together in a, in a, into a succinct one, uh, which is whether a goal of, of government-sponsored cultural diplomacy could be to mitigate the perceived unintended consequences of that informal and interpersonal uh, relationships that you talked about. He had specifically thought about race and 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 segregation, but maybe maybe more generally and whether whether government kind of constructively tried to pull in a in, in a different direction, I suppose. Yes, the goal of cultural diplomacy is always to exercise a maximum of control and to anticipate unintended consequences uh, and to also channel um, um, all kinds of interactions in the in the right direction but but we have now many many studies that show that it doesn't always work that way you know I want to sort of point to for instance Penny von Eschen's study where um, Jazz groups like Louis, Louis Armstrong went abroad as ambassadors for racial equality. Um, and as Penny shows in, in her book, um, the unintended consequence was that they, they t Armstrong together with Dave Brubeck created this musical, uh, The Real Ambassadors, that, that presented like a sur subversive message. Others have written about the Peace Corps. Again, Kennedy's idea to bring American youth to to the world and show show American um, benevolence, but also but also the workings of American democracy. And many many Peace Corps volunteers came back and had turned against the United States and had basically taken the the position um, of of those countries or people in the countries where they where they were serving. So. Um, Cultural diplomats recognized that that um, this was an important part of diplomacy of outreach, um, and they tried their best to show um, to show American um, goodwill. And as 
far as I can tell, it worked the best when they did sort of um, integrate and permitted those kinds of that kind of unpredictability uh, into their into their mission. And the more they pressed, the more they tried to narrow this, the more it backfired in the in in the process. And which is why, sort of, particularly in the early 1950s, where American fears about communism were at their height, and the restrictions of civil liberties in the United States contracted significantly, that was a moment where most of these unintended consequences and most of these things backfired. And the moments where they were most secure, felt most secure, especially in the immediate post-war period, it worked best. And I think the German example is how unintended consequences, you know, sometimes worked in the United States' favor. And I, I really regard the American occupation of Germany as a success, in part because of these unintended consequences, um, that Americans didn't sort of rein it in more than they did. And they tried a lot harder later when this program of cultural diplomacy through USIA became more, more um, organized and more professional is when some of these things basically went away and and moved in the direction of 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 propaganda and i think christian christian you make that argument also that germans actually reacted negatively to when they thought that americans were engaging in overt propaganda that they actually that it backfired in 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 a way um, i don't know whether that exactly answered the question but but i think those are sort of the dynamics at play thank you this actually links into uh leads into uh two or three others, which, which are really about um, kind of responses on the ground in West Berlin, um, say to uh, the fear of, of, of 1950, or for that matter, the, the, the kind of gratefulness during the airlift, I suppose, although that's not specifically mentioned. Is there a recurrence of fear and maybe even a kind of a sense of bitterness in 1953 about perceived Western inaction, or was it more a The sense that the, the kind of more cautious policies of the Adenauer administration, which are appreciated in West Germany, of course, as you note, uh, were they also appreciated in West Berlin, or, or, or what's the bitterness towards the Americans for not for not acting more forcefully at that point? Your mic, Christian. I'm sorry, Seth. You may also um, uh, chime in here, but um, I think there's. Um, uh, it was, there certainly was disappointment um, in uh, in Berlin and and in East Germany. I have um, you know in the book some some quotes from East Germans um, where the SED party uh, um, cadres report um, you know that um, you know from one village that the entire village is in the pub drinking to the health of Adenauer because they believe they um, that uh, Western help is coming that this is. Um, uh, partly a response to um, uh, um, that that the uh, new course um, and the the um, uh, that the new course is partly a response to Western pressure and there's a great expectation initially of Western support um, throughout um, uh, East Germany uh, um, and um, that of course um, over time um, uh, fosters disappointment as the food program um, uh, uh, major oh. uprising, um, yes, does um, address some of the economic um, um, uh, shortcomings uh, symbolically, um, uh, throws them into sharp relief, allows these Germans to. Um, uh, uh, connect and uh, with with the West to visibly show defiance um, uh, uh, towards the GDR authorities. I give some examples to what length uh, East Germans and Berliners go to actually go to Ber to West Berlin uh, and receive those packages. Um, yet in the end, it also shows the um, um, the fact that the United States. Um, you know, did not militarily intervene as some uh, within the administration had uh, considered um, and um, was in a sense powerless to um, uh, 
uh, alleviate the um, uh, the suffering of the East Germans um, uh, and um, uh, address their grievances in in sort of the, in and the political issues uh, that they raised. So um, um, I think rec the, the recognition of the, of Western imp importance to uh, really change the fate of East Germans without risking uh, glo a global nuclear conflagration um, uh, led to, you know, a rethinking of um, the Western American approach. Um, and you can, I would say, you can sort of see the very early beginnings of a Politik der kleinen Schritte, you know, and um, uh, the, the policy of small steps um, vis-a-vis engaging uh, with the East, alleviating um, uh, some of the, the shortcomings and um, um, and and uh, um, uh, economic uh, shortcomings in the East um, uh, through aid programs. I mentioned in my talk that the food program becomes kind of a model for how uh, for how uh, Washington would. Um, try to uh, engage with um, East Germans in the coming years, not just East Germans, uh, with Eastern Europe more broadly. Um, and, um, you know, uh, um, uh, against the backdrop of um, a failure of um, uh, 1953, but then also the Berlin Foreign Ministers Conference in, um, in 1954 and the 1955 summit, um, um, uh, you have um, um, you have these uh, policies as perhaps the most tangible result of, of um, uh, uh, 1953, but it's clearly a, um, a falls short of the expectations that many uh, East Germans um, and uh, surely many uh, West Berliners and West Germans had as well. Um, so. Um, uh, I think there's there's uh, more work to be done on looking at um, uh, uh, media coverage in West Berlin of, of some of the um, uprising. Uh, perhaps it's been done uh, already, but um, uh, uh, that there was a, a sense of disappointment. Um, uh, it makes, as I've tried to argue for uh, Berlin 53 as, as um, a less heroic uh, Berlin crisis than those we've, or, or, or narrative, a less heroic narrative of um, uh, the West's facing um, uh, the Soviet the Soviet challenge in Berlin, as you know, in, as in uh, 48, 58, 61. Hmm. Well, thank you, Christian. We are a few minutes past three o'clock, uh, and at least on my end, the Teams app is uh, slowing down from time to time. So I'll take that as a sign uh, to thank you all very much. But I, I also wanted to mention I was struck by, you know, the great complexity at the time uh, in, in all three talks, in a way how difficult it was even to interpret events as they were occurring. And um, that leads me back to, uh, uh, to your opening, Petra, about historical analogs, which, of course, we all use and seek for and, and strive for and should strive for. Um, but if they're complex at the time and they remain complex, with the benefit of hindsight, the, the actionability is uh, you know, maybe a, a, a very tricky proposition. Um, I also want to say, Christian, I'll send you a couple of questions from uh, one of our PhD students here uh, that, that I can pull out of the uh, the link and maybe CC Thank him you. on it, because I think that's a wider conversation uh, about uh, some of the work that the Cold War International History Project uh, has, has done too. So thank you uh, all three very much. Thanks again to Joe Shields too for uh, the welcome remarks earlier. We are back tomorrow morning at 10 Eastern time. That is uh, 4 p.m. in Berlin, if my math doesn't entirely uh, uh, escape me here, uh, on a slightly different YouTube channel. So if you go back to the announcement piece, you'll, you'll see there are three different links for the three different sessions. Uh, and I hope we'll get uh, engaging questions again. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon or evening, depending on, on where you are, and that we may meet again tomorrow. Thank you. Bye all. Bye -bye. Thank you.